we just don't let fear really get in the way because we have a compelling enough why. Realizing that personal finance is personal and now for yourself deciding what is like, what do I actually want and what am I willing to let go to get what I want? And when we asked ourselves that question, it meant that we were able to let go of things that were actually truthfully not important to us, but may have been important to everybody else, but was just not what was the essence of our lives. And so we just dialed in on literally the 20% that was important to us. We celebrated it at an 80%. And that is the result of what you see today. Welcome millionaires and future millionaires. You're listening to the Millionaires Unveiled podcast, a show where you'll hear the stories and interviews of everyday millionaires. We'll unveil their decisions, their strategies, and their portfolio allocation. Now to your host, Jace Mattinson. Welcome back to another episode of the Millionaires Unveiled Podcast. This is episode number 308. Stace, what's going on in your world? How are you doing? Hey, you know, I'm actually sitting pretty this weekend because I'm here in Nashville, Tennessee with my sisters on a girl's trip. So this is not something I get to do very often, but it's been a, been a fun little getaway. Nice. Or what's happening in, in Nashville? Well, we've, of course, spent some time doing the, the usual activities activities. We've gotten to see some singer-songwriters. Uh, we've liked kind of the more intimate settings. Broadway Street is crazy. <laughs> it feels like Vegas or 6th Street had a baby on steroids. Um, so that, that was a fun little experience, but didn't spend too much time on, on Broadway. And so the learning more about how music is produced, learning more about some of the stories that are written. It was fun last night. We went to the listening room uh, we also went to the Bluebird Cafe before that, which is really intimate. We didn't actually get to get in. Um, we, it was sold out, but we got to go in for a song and buy some merchandise, which was a, a fantastic economic move <laughs> by the Bluebird Cafe because we ended up spending more buying merch than we would have just for our entrance and the, the how much you have to spend, uh, the food minimum. So anyway, the listening room was cool. It was fun to hear these songwriters sing songs that you hear on the radio. And these are the guys who actually wrote the songs. Sometimes it's in collaboration with whoever actually ended up picking it up. Sometimes it's not. So cool to hear some of the stories. We also have gotten to spend some time learning more about Civil War and about some less glamorous parts of U.S. history, slavery. And um, that was hard, but also very important. And I feel like, you know, we have a lot of people who come on the show and they talk about traveling. And, and, and I feel like, at least in our family, since the beginning, when we were saving, you know, everything we could, what we would spend money on was travel. And I just feel like it's one thing to read about history. It's one thing to read about even U.S. history, read about how music's produced, wh whatever. Then you dive into a place and you're able to really learn about where you are kind of differently than reading about it or hearing about it. So that's been cool. I, I really love that aspect of travel. We got a car so we can kind of drive around, check out some of the ne nearby areas and not just be confined to downtown. And uh, and I also just like to see how, if I lived here, what would life be like living here and kind of driving through some neighborhoods and whatnot. And anyway, so that's, that's, been, a, that's been a fun experience. I have not seen We've had no celebrity sightings, unfortunately, but <laughs> but it's been fun nonetheless. I mean, the Carrie Underwood concert counts, right? <laughs> oh, we have had celebrity sightings. Yes, yes, we went to um, we went to the Grand Ole Opry on Friday night, and I, to be honest, I thought we were going to a Carrie Underwood concert, and and I also loved Dustin Lynch, and he was opening that night, which is why we did Friday instead of Saturday. And we get there, find out it is this, it is the longest standing radio show. It's been on for 98 years and it is a live radio show. And they had a spectrum of guests come on. They're all on for about 20 or 30 minutes from people who are kind of up and coming. They had Connie Smith, who my grandma would love if she were still here with us. Uh, they had a stand-up comedian. Uh, Henry Cho, who was hilarious, and I love comedy. So that was a real treat. It was really fun. Just It's been fun to kind of have a little bit more of an authentic uh, Nashville experience than um, than just uh, hanging out on Broadway Street. Yeah, the time that I took you there and we went mountain biking instead of doing anything else. <laughs> oh, that was so fun, though. And actually, I will say the reason I wanted to come back is because we did that mountain biking trip. 
and we had driven through some some beautiful areas and I just like pretty places. I, I'm here for pretty places. So uh, I, I remember driving through the neighborhood and I was like, this is so pretty. I want to come back here. So um, yes, it's it's a definitely a girl's trip destination. The number of bachelorette parties is staggering. And and I think you'd have a good time here doing some of these uh some of these activities, but you know, I know you'd rather be on the trail someplace. No, I like doing some of the, the sightseeing and stuff too. One of the wild things right now that's going on, I guess just concluded for the first part of the North American tour is Taylor Swift's Era Tour, who got her start there in Nashville. Who A- economic- actually, I'm she corrected. got picked up. No, 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 you're right. But she got picked up at the Bluebird Cafe. She invited, from my understanding, I could be absolutely wrong. And if I am, you can correct. But my understanding is she invited a producer to the Bluebird Cafe when she was there one night, she's 14 years old at the time she got signed after that. Wow, pretty crazy. So a couple of things. She's probably, I mean, she's going on an international tour here. She's turned down an uh, opportunity or an offer to perform at the Super Bowl. And man, it looks like she is going to probably, this tour is going to be well within the four to five billion range. Is wild. The economic impact just to local communities that she's performed at, you know, cities like Cincinnati, LA, et cetera has been on par in terms of hotel and restaurants and everything else, has been on par with the Super Bowl. In a lot of cases, she's played four to five shows there. People are spending an average of $1,300 on show expenses, which includes tickets, outfits, travel, and food, which is crazy. That was only a survey of 600 people. But at any rate, I think this is the the wildest thing. 71%, so you think about customer satisfaction, satisfaction from you know, the, the product. 71% say it was worth it. 91% said they'd go again. That is wild to me. I don't know of very many places that have a 91% satisfaction rate, but at any rate, the Taylor Swift Airs Tour does. She is coming back after she goes international for a few more shows she announced nationally. So pretty crazy. Glad you're enjoying that. She's amazing. That we... We did, we did not get to go to her sh- show, me and you. We have not been to her concert, but we've heard just fantastic things. And my understanding, again, I always correct me if I'm wrong, I believe she's making, I think, 13 to $15 million per show is what her take-home is. Well, maybe not her take-home. That's at before she's paying people out and whatnot. But I'd do that. I think I would sing for three hours. <laughs> <laughs> right. Stagger- staggering amount of money. She's obviously probably already a billionaire at this point. But I think there's a lot of good business lessons, which we probably won't get into today, that that uh, can be taken from her as well. Great performer, great artist, and and really running a great business uh, from a show standpoint. So today on the show, we've got probably one of your favorite guests to date, and that's Dr. Lati Fat. She's a net worth of oh, $2 she's, million. She's lovely, and she's hilarious. And she definitely has things set for her. But if something were to happen, I think comedy would be a fantastic alternative. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's great. She's actually taking a sabbatical right now with her family. So we get into the details of how and why and what she's doing on the sabbatical. Uh, she is a GI doctor and has been and been practicing uh, for, for quite a few, I guess not quite that long compared. I mean, you figure med school and residency and whatnot. She's been practicing for less than a couple decades at this point. Uh, but yeah, 60% in real estate and 40% in the market. So kind of in pretty uh, interesting allocation, especially for a physician. We typically don't see this, uh, but we get into the details of that and why she you know, wanted to learn personal finance and what she's doing about it now. It's pretty unique. She uh, just wrote a book actually. And uh, yeah, great, great interview with her. I'm super excited uh, for that. A lot of, a lot of great bombs dropped uh, today. Last week we had, uh, we had Jeremy. He had a net worth of 1.7, 80%, which was in real estate. Young, young buck, as they say. Great episode with him. Somebody who's just getting started on their journey and is well on their way to financial independence. If you're interested in being on the show, send us an email, meownersinvild at gmail.com. Also, if you want to enter to win a free box of Factor, go ahead and leave us a review on iTunes. Send a screenshot of it and we'll enter you into the review. Only a couple more weeks here before we uh, make the drawing for these. I've got a couple of them, so there's going to be a couple winners. Want to read a couple of reviews we got uh, this week. This one uh, comes from Tardscar. 
All right. This is mostly good info. The hosts do a great job. I appreciate the updates on financial subjects at the beginning of episodes that I otherwise may have missed while not keeping up with the news. I would like to hear many more episodes with older guests, 50 plus, approaching retirement or already retired, who can impart wisdom from years of experience. I would like to hear less from 20 and 30 somethings who think they have it all figured out. Overall, good show. Tart Sky, appreciate that. As always, uh, it's volunteer. So we try to get a broad range of guests ages, occupations, et cetera. And uh, unfortunately, and we've called out, but I think it's another time to call out. We'd love to have some more that are that are in that retirement age. We've had a few over the last, I don't know, probably year, year and a half. I've got a couple in the pipeline coming up, but uh, yeah, I think part of it also, you know, 50 and 60 year olds are to the point where they don't consume media via podcasts or YouTube channels or et cetera. I could be wrong on that, but our data kind of shows us that. So at any rate, if you're in that age category or our, our listeners would love to hear from you and so would I, because it is uh, it is unique. But I do have a couple coming up in the pipeline. So I'll make sure to call those out just for you, Tartscar. Uh, one more real quick, Patar91, something for everyone. This podcast tells fantastic stories that show that any person can become a millionaire regardless of where they started in life as long as they're willing to work hard and learn. It's a weekly dose of inspiration that keeps me motivated to continue my own financial journey. So many perspectives. It's nice to hear that there are different ways to get where they, to get where I want to go. Appreciate the Petard 91. And uh, yeah, without any further delay, let's get into the episode with Dr. Latifat. Latifat, do you want to just give us a little about your background and what you're up to now? Absolutely. Thanks for having me here. I am a physician. I live in California usually. I am currently at the beginning part of a year-long sabbatical that we're doing with our family. And I am currently here hanging out with you. (laughs) Awesome. And apologies. I should have called you Dr. Latifat, but uh, forgive me for that. So before we get rolling, what kind of physician are you? I am a gastroenterologist, so I talk about poop all day pretty much. (laughs) fun. Yes. That is definitely important. If we uh, if we don't have that bodily function, I'm sure all of us are very uncomfortable. Absolutely. So I, I hear about it all day long too, but I think for different reasons. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a uh, it's a fun job. I love. I it's a pleasure to do what I do. I love what I do, and it's an honor to serve people the way that I do. And it's also great to be able to take a pause right now and do what I'm also doing with my family. Yeah, no, that's awesome, and and we're gonna get into a little bit of that. But before we do, what's your net worth today? Roughly two million, slightly over that. Awesome. And how is that broken up? It is mostly out to sixty percent real estate and then forty percent in the stock market, index funds, boring stuff. Okay. And and the money that is in the market, is that in retirement accounts? Is that in brokerage account? How is that broken up? So we have in retirement accounts and we have primarily retirement accounts and about a hundred or so in brokerage account. Okay. And then the real estate, which is a, a nice chunk, is that primary residence, rentals? What's the, the deal there? Yeah, it's a combination, mostly non-primary. We invest in long-term and short-term rentals. We've done that for the last couple of years, but we do have some equity in our home, but we don't yeah, that's not a that's a minor part of a small per, um, per percentage of the real estate assets. Okay. And how many how many properties do you have? We have 14 doors split between mostly long term and we have two short term rentals in different markets. Okay, wow. Let's uh if you don't mind, let's dive into that a little bit. So, when did you start investing in real estate and what was that first deal like for you? We started investing in real estate about 3 and a half or 4 years ago. And honestly, I'm just going to rewind slightly back. Seven years ago, I knew zero about money. I knew nothing. I did not know what a 401k was. I hated numbers. I still don't love numbers, um, but I'm okay. I like them enough that I make them work for me. So we started with just the regular stock market stuff. And then it was about four, almost four years ago that we decided that we wanted to diversify outside of the stock market. And so we started with long-term rental. And, you know, we're based in California and a lot of 
properties in California are super expensive and most don't talk about cash flow, which is something that was important to us because we wanted to not just have assets only, but we also always wanted to have a choice in how we spent our life and our time. And again, as a physician, it's important for me to do what I can to take care of my patients. And I truly believe that I can do that better when I have the freedom to stay or leave by choice. And so our first property was in uh, Washington State. Long-term rental was a triplex. Not expensive at all because at that point we thought we didn't have money to invest. So we started with a property that was literally $200,000. And, you know, it needed some work. So we were happy to do this, you know, sweat equity. We did some rehabbing, forced the appreciation that way. And it's done great with cash flow and also appreciation over the last couple of years. So you buy that first property. Did you buy that in cash? No, not in cash. Most of the properties we've bought so far have not been in cash. We typically do um, typically 20 to 25 percent down. So the first property was 20 percent, I believe, down. And we did the rehab in with cash. And so that's where a lot of our money for that property went. Okay. And are you doing the Burr method with most of these where you're pulling back out some chunk when you refinance or are you just doing the rehab and leaving it in and raising the rents? You know, it's sort of a mixture. We, I will be honest with you, I don't necessarily like definition, so I didn't attach our process to Burr. The key was cash flow, force appreciate, increase the equity in the property. So that was our our strategy. And honestly, it's only been one of our properties that we've done a cash out refi and pulled money out of and put into another property. The rest of the properties, it's been, you know, us being good with how we spend and releasing funds from, you know, 401k and things like that to use as down payment for those properties. But yeah, so one property would, would, it would be what you would consider Burr. And then after you did that first one, I mean, how soon after did you do two, three, four, five, six, seven and beyond? (laughs) We actually did it pretty quickly, which was interesting considering the fact that we thought we didn't have the money to start and I did not rub a bank as far as I know, but I don't know, maybe, <laughs> who knows, but um, the within a year and a half, less than two years was when we bought most of the property, except for the short-term rentals. The short-terms have come, we bought one late last year and then one the year before that, but otherwise everything else was within a two-year period. And are most of these properties around that first one that you bought or are they scattered throughout? In terms of cost or location? Location. They are scattered throughout, kind of. So we invest in two markets in Northern California and Washington State. So we've stayed really focused on those two markets. Our long term is in Northern California and Washington State and our short term rental too actually is in both of those markets too. And why did you choose those two markets? At first, we wanted to start in California, but the numbers were not acting kindly in terms of cash flow. So we decided that the most important thing is to start, right? Just start from where you are. And our key was we wanted to invest in a place that we could get to quickly. So direct flight, very practical things, direct flight, cash flow, reasonable priced so that if there's an emergency, right, myself or my spouse would be able to fly direct on, you know, an airline. So that's why Washington State met those requirements. And we, we don't like sitting down in indecision. So once we found a market that worked, we just decided that it was best to get great at that market than keep shopping for other markets. And it's worked out pretty well for us. Are you managing all these properties yourself? Well, the one in Washington State, we have a property management company that we use, but the ones that are in Northern California, we do manage them ourselves. My husband is a very nice guy and a good landlord, so he's a better person than I am, so he does a lot of the management. (laughs) Very good. I know some people feel really overwhelmed with the idea of managing properties themselves. Have you felt like it's been overwhelming? Has it felt manageable? What kind of time does it take for you to manage these properties? To be honest with you, I think, you know, with everything in general in life, you have to, the stronger and the more compelling your why, right? It doesn't get necessarily easier, but you just are more focused and committed to the process. So for us, our why was important. Our why was we wanted to have choices, wanted to diversify. We wanted to force appreciate our net worth, for lack of a better term. And so if you think about the opportunity cost of what you would be doing to create what you're creating, it would be working 
hours, additional hours away from family, not flexible, not being present. So, you know, that that really is the main thing. So if I compare that with how we would be making the money otherwise, complaining about property management would be kind of silly. But also, right, the question is, I think a lot of times it's over-exaggerated what amount of work it actually requires. Because at the end of the day, you know, it, you know, going back to that book by Dan Sullivan that I absolutely love, it's Who Not How, the fact that we're managing the property ourselves, if there's a leak going on, doesn't mean I'm going to be the one under the sink. I get to find my who that's going to help. So I do think a lot of it comes down to like how we think about stuff and the mindset of it. But we just don't let fear really get in the way because we have a compelling enough why and we just get it done. But on honestly, with anything, the setup is the most demanding. However, once you're done setting things up, it can become not super automated, but less labor intensive. So, I mean, right now we're outside of the country of our tenants that we're managing have issues. We would do the same thing we were doing when we were there, which is get our handy person to go take a look at it, right? So currently, I would say even before we left home for our travel, averagely would be total maybe four hours a month and that's including our short-term rental if you include the little fragments of messaging time that you get in from from visitors or guests wow that definitely seems manageable so you're a gastroenterologist right say that yes, right ma'am. Mm-hmm. <laughs> or gi you can just say and, gi doc yeah that's what i usually say you're a gi doc <laughs> yes. and uh and your husband does he have does he have another job outside of managing the properties as well Absolutely. So, well, I mean, that is varied over time, but he's a network engineer. He has his own IT consulting, um, consulting stuff that he does as he chooses to. But yes, he does have that. Okay. So you're both juggling these property man- this property management uh, on top of your, your other, other jobs. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, when the, res- when the pandemic started, I was, you know, a lot busy in the hospital and he did a lot of our property management. That was his primary work that he did during that time. Um, because again, we have little kids and with schools being out and all that stuff, we had to pivot. The hospital was busier, even more busy than usual. And so, you know, we just, we, we make things work and it's not as we all have different strengths. And for those whose spouses are investing or whatnot with them we have different strengths we don't try to is nicer and I truly mean that he is nicer so he's a better property manager than I am so it's great that is a you know forward-facing person when it comes to that and I have other you know other strengths that I bring to the table as well well he must be fantastic because you are very kind yourself <laughs> he's, he's he's a I like him, <laughs> I like him. <laughs> yes so you dove right into a property with three doors on it. What made you decide to go for that? Was it just the price point? I mean, most people start with something that is going to be a long-term rental, just one door. What, what made you feel confident in that choice? So at that point when we were trying to decide whether we wanted to go into real estate or not, we met a physician couple that do real estate and they were great. They have a course and they still have a course. In fact, before this, I was guest coaching in their membership community. And, you know, so we took a course and that really accelerated our process of learning, right? Doesn't mean you cannot learn it by without taking a course, but you have to decide what is of more value to you. For us as busy professionals, our time and not needing to go Google forever was of primary interest to us. So having something that was nice and concise was a huge asset. So that helped us with feeling comfortable in a shorter amount of time than typical because we had the condensed information. And we could have done a single family, but you know, there's risk and benefit to everything that you do. There is downside to having single family. If you have a multifamily, even a small multifamily like that, having multiple sources of cash flow or a rent from different tenants helps mitigate some of the risks that is associated with real estate. So for us, we've never, the only single families we have, honestly, are short-term rentals. Otherwise, we do small multifamily so that we can diminish the, the risk a little bit. And if you buy the properties right and they're cash flowing, it can really be a huge deal. So honestly, since we've been doing real estate, our properties have been cash flowing and taking care of themselves with, with some extras. Well, very impressive. You've really covered a lot of ground in a short amount of time. 
I, I'd actually love to back up a little bit because this is we haven't had a lot of physicians on. And what is a challenge I find for physicians, in fact, one of my girlfriends, her husband's a cardiologist, and she was just asking me, she said, do you have any episodes for someone who starts really late? Uh, she actually had a friend who was, I think he was finishing medical school at like 40 or something, but he was going ER, so it's going to be a three-year residency. I mean, but regardless, whatever your your discipline is, you're usually, you've got four years medical school, then three to six year residency, plus often a one year fellowship and you're graduating all of this. Oh, I graduated along the way, but you're, you're finished with all of this training and you have $200,000, $300,000 worth of debt. And now you're finally able to make money, but you haven't been investing for you know 10 to 15 years like some of your other uh, other peers you know who would have been your graduating class of high school or college you know have been so start there what did you do to start really building your wealth when uh, did you did you uh, did you finish your training and a large amount of debt how did you recover from that obviously we see where you've kind of come from there but maybe back up just a little bit absolutely i mean you describing that absolutely that's our story um you know it takes forever it takes a long time to be a physician and you know, it is important that we do that because we, you know, the human body is is a work of art. And I think it deserves the time that it deserves for us to be excellent at what we do. And so, yes, as a GI doc, it means, you know, college for a minimum of four years, med school for a minimum of four years, three years of residency, and three years of fellowship. So as a cardiologist, it's very similar. And some people would do additional one year or two year fellowship even after that. So it's a long process. And so if you're someone that has had another career before medicine or decided late, it gets even later. And that's one of the disadvantages, quote unquote, that physicians can have is the fact that our college colleagues, right, started earning earlier than we did. So we usually are later to the game, later to the table. And unfortunately, medical education does not include financial education at all. So literally, when I did finish, I had a lot of debt. I had, you know, for student debt only was about a hundred and something thousand dollars. I owed about two hundred thousand dollars, and I didn't know what I owed, to be honest with you. And I think that's one of the things that I. I think it's important for your audience to hear because it's easy to hear people and their stories and the after, but the before is just as important. But literally seven years ago, I knew zero about money. I didn't even know what a 401k was. So all you'll see is I, I, not educa- I was not educated about any of that stuff at all. But it was really when I started um, being an attending, meaning I'd done with training, was when I decided that, okay, I knew that I loved what I do and I would have been happy being in practicing medicine forever. I would, my goal in life was just to be a great GI doctor. That was it, to serve my patients and do the best that I could do in the world. But I also knew that there was a lot of changes that was happening in the healthcare platform and insurance companies were getting more powerful and administration was getting more powerful. And honestly, for me, I decided that the most important thing that we all have is our voice and our freedom of expression in that regard. So I knew that to be the kind of physician that I had, to, that I wanted to be, that I needed to take control of my finances. The other thing was at that point when I started, I had two kids at that point. Now we have three. And, you know, I'm. it's a very common story as a physician. I'm 39 weeks pregnant doing 30 hour shifts in the ICU. So even with my kids being little, there were many things that I wasn't a part of in their baby stages. My daughter started daycare when she was like eight weeks old. So for me, I knew that going forward in my life, I wanted to, if I was at the hospital, I wanted to be there because this is where I'm meant to be. I did not want to apologize for choices that I thought I did not have. So that was the main inspiring reason. Like that was what compelled me to literally get my, I don't want to say the S word, but I'm a GI doc, but literally get my ish together um, and get my money right. So it started not fancy, not pretty. It was literally things like Googling, what is a budget? Oh, I hate budgeting. How can I do money even if I hate spreadsheets? I still hate spreadsheets. So my thing was I had to go learn money in a way that made sense for me. So I had to learn the numbers of math and translate it into a language that made sense. And I didn't care about the micro details. I wasn't going to do any, you know, cash based anything. I wasn't going to like beat myself up 
for not knowing where everything was to the pennies. So it was like macro level was how I decided that I was going to do my money based on the time that I had. And so that's literally how I started. I still don't do spreadsheets. I use Mint, which is pretty easy and simple. You know, I monitor our assets using like, you know, personal capital now empowered and so just the key was to just start slow and easy um take advantage of the any sort of like retirement based stuff so if there's any contributions or matching at work taking advantage of that during my 401k maxing i had access to some mega backdoor roth ira options i took advantage of that so really it's a matter of deciding what is important for you realizing that personal finance is personal and now for yourself deciding what is like what do I actually want and what am I willing to let go to get what I want and when we asked ourselves that question it meant that we were able to let go of things that were actually truthfully not important to us but may have been important to everybody else but was just not what was the essence of our lives. And so we just dialed in on literally the 20% that was important to us. We celebrated it at an 80%. And that is the result of what you see today. Amazing. I thank you so much for sharing all these nuggets of wisdom. Also, you have me rolling. So if GI doesn't work out for you and rental properties don't work out, please take up comedy. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. I may be a broke comedian. And well, now it doesn't really matter. My kids don't think I'm funny, but whatever. <laughs> Well, I, I've been muted this whole time, fortunately. Have you paid off all of your student debt now at this point? Absolutely. That was the first thing we did. If I was to do it now, I may do it differently, but I'm glad that it worked out the way it did. But I didn't know anything about finances. I didn't know anything about investing. But I knew that, well, if I paid off my debt, that's something that people say you should do. So that was the first thing we did. I had, like I mentioned, almost, or I had about $200,000 in debt. We refinanced student loans. I had federal at that point. I refinanced at a low interest rate at that point with SoFi. And the goal was to pay it off in five years, but I signed up intentionally for variables. So it was like a fire in my bum to like pay it off. So I paid it off in like two and a half years instead of five. And again, it was without like any crazy strict budget, but it was with intentional spending and just not doing things that, you know, everybody else wanted to do, but doing things that really mattered to us. You said that maybe you would do it differently now, but you're glad that it worked out the way that it did. Why would you possibly do it differently? I mean, it worked out, right? But, you know, when it comes to it, now I know differently and my money mindset and my money mentality has definitely changed. I think when I first started, I was um, averse to debt. I thought debt was bad. Debt was horrible. And there's some people that still believe that and that's okay, but that's not what I believe right now. I believe in not over leveraging. I believe in wisdom when it comes to money and considering how low the interest rates were then, if I was starting from where I was now, I would have started investing earlier. That's what I would have done. And, you know, I may have paid it off in five years instead of two and a half years that I I did. But again, no regrets. Regret is useless. I did what I did. And I'm, you know, we just course correct if we don't like the results. Yeah, for sure. So let's switch gears here just a little bit. Where do you go from here? I know you're taking a sabbatical and you're living it up. What is the plan for the future? Because you're still super young. I'm never going to ask a woman her age, but for our listeners, she's still young. Super That's young. okay. I used to be embarrassed <laughs> about my age. I'm 39. I've lived multiple lifetimes and I'm so grateful to be here. And honestly, the answer to that question is I don't know. And I'm sitting down getting more comfortable with the idea of I don't know. Out of what I didn't share on your stuff is because of the stuff that I've learned when it comes to money and wisdom, I work with women physicians in terms of like helping keep them on track, accountability, coaching to help them really get good with their money as well. And, you know, I've been doing that now for about two years or so alongside with working full time and everything else that I was doing. So now I'm doing that still on a small scale. But I don't know, to be honest with you, I'm just listening to what I'm meant to do. I think right now I'm meant to be in this pause of just like, you know, spending time with family, praying, 
you know, just building myself up again. And then next year, I know that I do want to practice medicine because I truly love what I do. So I will do that in some capacity on my terms. However, I know that part of my work is also to help physicians decrease burnout, which is rampant. And part of that is through financial empowerment. So what that is going to look like exactly, I don't know, but I'm getting comfortable with the idea of not knowing. So what gave you the confidence to go take a, a sabbatical of a year and walk away from being a physician full time? <laughs> I love the fact that you added that last part full time to it, like for dramatic effect, like the T-fat. What did you do? To be, I will be honest with you. I, number one is I wanted to. That was it. And I think that that is important because a lot of times people think you have to hate what you're doing to pause and take a break from it. You actually don't. I was not burnt out. I love my patients. They love me for the most part. It's a gift to do what I do. But I just, it just felt like it's a gut feeling that it was meant to, I I was meant to pause right now. The other thing is, again, if I'm going to be completely transparent, my faith is important to me. And one of the things that I felt like was nudging in my gut or my spirit was that, I was supposed to pause to figure out what my combo was going to be for the next decade or so. So it's both of those and just trust in the fact that I can always change my mind. I always have my own back and I don't do regret. So we we move forward. Did you feel like you needed to get to a certain level of net worth to be able to do that? You know, that's a great question. And the only reason why I cannot say that is because a sabbatical is not even something that I planned on a long time ago. It was literally late summer slash early fall last year was when I said, my husband and I said, it would be nice. And we said, okay, it would be nice. So at that point, we didn't have to make that decision. But I do know that having our finances the way that we have it, where, you know, we're diversified, we know where our money is going, we're not, our identity is not tied to what we have or not have. And I think that has created the real freedom to let us do whatever. If we were struggling financially, we would not, I don't think we would, think we had the choice that we made. So the gift that we gave ourselves, even before we knew that we were ever going to want a sabbatical, is why it made it easier or more possible for us to take the leap and just say, mm, yeah, we're going to do it. And we'll, you know, we get to live multiple lifetimes in one. So, yeah. That's awesome. Good for y'all. I want to go back to something that you brought up that I think is a, a very real thing. I've got a lot of friends and some family that are all in the medical field. And we've had a couple on our podcast, as Stacy mentioned, it's not very many, but we have had a couple and, and all of them have brought up, and in some cases, most recently, Doc G, who is kind of more, more retired, you know, in his late 40s, burnout, specifically in the profession in medicine. Why do you think that's the case? And how is, in general, how are people adjusting to that? Oh, I mean, honestly, burnout is, this is a topic that actually is, you know, yeah, kind of breaks my heart. But burnout is real. It's been the case even before the pandemic, to be honest with you. But the pandemic definitely expedited that for a lot of physicians. And I think that part of it is because physicians, you know, we're kind of, we're crazy enough that in our teens, we decided that we're going to sacrifice our 20s and early 30s to do what we do. And I think there's a lot of misconception about physicians. Most physicians don't do what we do for money. I promise you, you know, we make, (laughs) there's many ways of making money that is not excruciating as what we do in medicine. So most physicians really, if you, I tell people, if you want to be inspired, go read the personal statement that physicians write at the beginning of every level of their training, like it would inspire you. And the truth is because we go in because we truly want to create a better world. We want to serve our patients. We want to help people and we want to feel good while doing it too, right? Because when you're a giver, there's a part that you receive back. You feel good for giving and that's part of it. However, you know, with the way that unfortunately the insurance and the way that control and money train and everybody has something to say about how the practice of medicine for good or for bad depending on you know what your opinions and your thoughts are about that it definitely has made physicians almost feel you know like the bad guys right and the sad part is you know if you ask I mean I'm a physician so I'm in a lot of physician spaces I talk to my colleagues my members and all this stuff and 
I will tell you that what we wish for, what we desire is exactly what our patients desire. We desire more time with our patients. We hate charting. We desire that computer systems will disappear. We just will wake up one day and they will no longer exist so that we can actually sit down and enjoy the part of our job that we love the most, which is talking with you. But because of the pressures of the system, the rules that exist about who can own hospitals or not, physicians are sometimes the forward, the face of those unfortunately the system that a lot of us disagree with and when you come have that and you now add a system that doesn't teach physicians how to do money a system that doesn't teach physicians about the business of money it is almost set up to be an unwell relationship so physicians are stuck between what they actually want to do versus what the system is making us not able to do or do. And whenever you're not in integrity with yourself completely because of the system and the stresses of the system, you know, it's not unusual for a physician to get paid a copy of like 50 bucks for spending like time with you in person, reviewing your labs, responding to your messages and all this other stuff, right? But those are things we don't necessarily talk about. I get to talk about that because you asked me about it. But you can now imagine that system of like being in between and getting crushed and I think that's the reason why physicians are burnt out and so part of what I do when it comes to financial wellness and empowering physicians is really equipping us to be truly be free whatever that means so that we can serve patients the way that we want to serve patients so that we're not serving them because we have to but we're serving them because we want to and that is going to be a key player in how we take power back which is what a lot of physicians want we want physician autonomy we want to be able to own hospitals we want to be able to take care of our patients we want to be able to spend an hour with you. Like literally our, our goals are aligned, but we're fighting against a system where physicians are not necessarily free to express themselves. And because I don't work for anybody, I can tell you that. Well said. I've heard it multiple times offline in a very similar manner. <laughs> yeah. Now that we are in the thick of summer, you might be looking for a wholesome, convenient meals to support, support sunny, active days factor. America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit can help you fuel up fast with flavorful and nutritious ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, eat well, and stay on track reaching your goals. Looking for calorie-conscious options this summer? Try delicious, dietitian approved calorie-smart meals with around or less than 550 calories per serving. You need an extra boost to support your wellness goals this summer? Try Protein Plus meals with 30 grams of protein or more per serving. Factor and enjoy eating well without the hassle. Simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh, flavor-packed meals delivered straight to your door. Ready in just two minutes. No prep, no mess. And as a user myself, I must say they are absolutely amazing. They taste great, they're quick, they're easy, delivered straight to my door, and I love it. Head to factormeals.com slash millionaire50 and use code millionaire50 to get 50% off. That's code millionaire50 at factormeals.com slash millionaire50 to get 50% off. And thanks for to Factor for supporting today's episode. Well, good deal. I want to uh, transition a little something. So recently you wrote a book, just came out actually not too long ago. What is that book called and why did you write it? That book is called Done With Broke, The Woman Physician's Guide to More Money and Less Hustle. And I wrote that book because, again, physicians are not taught about money. A lot of mainstream financial education doesn't really take into account to what Stacy was talking about earlier, which is the fact that we start late, we know nothing about money, we are excellent at what we do clinically, and now we don't have the time. And the unique challenge is that physicians, and especially women physicians, deal with when it comes to finances. There's also lots of, you know, there's data showing that women physicians tend to get paid less in medicine, women of color even more so. So there's a lot of like challenges that are unique to us that is hard for non-physicians to really describe when it comes to understanding why we are where we are today. And if we don't start from where we are today, it's kind of hard for us to move forward. So I wrote that book because I couldn't talk to, you know, the 80,000 physicians that I want to reach. 
So I figured a book is a good way. They can get it. They can read it in the corner of their room. They can read it at all hours of the night and they can really learn how to change how they think about money, how to change how they relate with money, their mentality, their relationship with money, and really how to be the CEO of their finances just so that we can take control of the lives that we have and serve the way that we want to serve. So the book is written for physicians that want to live a life that is in true congruence with who they're meant to be in the world and not wanting money to be the reason why they don't. Awesome. And where can people get that book right now? You can go on Amazon and just search for Done With Broke and you will find it. I've had people leave reviews on there that are not physicians and I'm you know, again, I wrote it for physicians, but it's given me so much joy to see that it's reaching people that are not even physicians. And, you know, we've, it came out on May 2nd, which was also my birthday, which so we had a big old party. We made Amazon bestseller and I'm just really humbled and grateful that I get to share with people the way that I get to. Awesome. Well, let's uh, transition into some rapid fire questions. What's the most expensive pair of shoes that you've purchased? So probably the shoes that I bought before we traveled, which is a Hoka, whatever it's called, H-O-K-A, because I'm like, I, we're going to be walking across the world. I need to make sure my back is good. So I bought those and I bought some Rothy's, which are supposed to be comfortable and ish, ish. But anyways, those are, the, <laughs> those are the shoes that I've spent the most on. And they were, I think, high 100s. Okay. What about the most expensive meal out that you paid for? Oh, definitely. I mean, we splurge for sure. Like when we go out for an anniversary, we don't necessarily look at how much it is, but mentally we know that we're going to make up for it somewhere else. So absolutely, we've spent money at nice restaurants in, you know, in Sacramento. And now that we're traveling, we definitely pick really nice restaurants to try out as experiences that we want to enjoy. Okay, and what 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 usually do you spend on some of those experiences or some of those higher end places? I would say for Two of us max that I can think of is maybe $400. Okay. What about the most expensive car that you've purchased? Oh, cars are not my thing. I have a RAV4 that, yeah, we bought that in 2012. I it was 2012. And it's a bad sign when someone walks to you and asks if you want to sell your car. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but, you know, whatever. I don't care about my car. I like to drive stuff that I wouldn't feel bad if someone ran into. Okay. What about the most expensive vacation or experience that you've paid for? I would say the sabbatical is probably one of our most expensive experiences. You know, we're just, we're doing it in a way that is well. We're not pinching pennies to do it. And it's just a gift that we're giving ourselves. And if we're not investing heavily this year, we'll still be very good. So. Okay. And just real quick on the sabbatical, are you paying for that with just cash in the bank, basically? Yeah, And then the rental much. properties? Yeah, absolutely. Yo, yes. I mean, you know, our savings is coming in handy for that. We just like emergency funds, how you can have like different levels or tiers, we're paying for it with cash that we've saved. We have, you know, all, multiple sources of income. So those are also coming in for the future. I like to be prepared. I don't like relying on one thing. So whatever we're earning now is for the future, not for the present. Okay. What about uh, health insurance? What are you doing for that while you're on your sabbatical? So there are great blogs and websites about traveling internationally. So we do have a health insurance that covers both local and international. Um, they're really, really strong internationally and would fly us if we had a medical emergency. Thankfully, you know, as a physician, I, you know, I actually took a picture of what looks like the pharmacy that I'm running and we have every prophylactic medication you can think about. So hopefully we'll be good. Okay. What was a key lesson you learned from childhood? A key lesson that I learned from childhood is don't live your life like you want to live, but always give yourself the ability to be able to be free no matter what. You don't ever want to be putting all your eggs in one basket, but our freedom is the most important thing. And that's one of the lessons that I learned. And my finances is built with that in mind as well. My freedom is important and everything I do is for that. Okay. Okay. This is actually not necessarily a rapid fire question, but... First, I just want to say I really commend you for all of the thoughtfulness you've put into building this life. You mentioned 
you want people to be the CEO of their finances. I feel like you've really placed yourself as a CEO of your life. You are running your life. Your life isn't running you, which is really unique, particularly for a physician, particularly for a female, particularly for a mom. <laughs> you know, there are so many weights on your shoulders that could be drowning you, but you're really pulling your life along yourself. You've mentioned your faith a couple of times through this interview. What type of role has your faith played through your journey? Um, my faith has played a really important point, um, part of it. And, you know, I have friends and members in my community that have no specific faith. But for me, uh, and, and they've done well in different, whatever that means to them. But for me, my faith is really important. I'm a Christian and, you know... <sighs> You know, I, I truly believe that life is a gift, to be honest with you. I don't believe anybody owes me anything. God doesn't owe me anything. And the fact that I'm here is just a gift that I get to be here and enjoy for myself. Don't get me wrong. I just told you about the $400 dinner. So I do enjoy my life very well, but also I enjoy being a gift um, to others. And the reason why I believe that is I don't, I think my life is for me and for others. And if I can serve people while I'm here, why not? But it's a huge part of my life. It's a, it's a huge part of how I'm able to honestly live in freedom. Um, because there's a trust. And it's a huge part of why I'm going to do really, really well, even in a recession, because there is a security, right? So, you know, there's like uncertain times, but I have, I can focus on the certainties, I can focus on the trust. And, you know, I, I trust myself because I've created sort of like evidence of why I can trust myself. But even more so than that, I trust God. And I know God's always got my back. And even when it's hard, I, you know, I know that, you know, the other side of that is going to be, is going to be great things. You know, life is up and down. It's not perfect, regardless of what your net worth is. But one thing that I know for sure is that, you know, God always has my back. And so that's a, that's a thought that I love. That's a truth that exists. And, you know, right now I'm, part of what I'm doing the sabbatical is just like, you know, splurging in time and praying and reading my Bible and taking walks. And before my kids get up, I've had like two and a half hours of just like indulging in that presence that I, that, that I love so much. And honestly, for me, that is probably been the biggest part of my life, but that's the script that I'm living my life based on by choice. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. I think uh, it sounds like it's been such an important aspect of who you are. So I appreciate you sharing how that's molded you. Absolutely. What's a closely held belief that you've recently changed your mind on? <laughs> I'm going to have to think about that one for a second. To be honest with you, I hold most, so most things, most thoughts that I have, I actually hold them pretty loosely because Every thought that I have is a thought that has helped me get to where I am right now. And what is going to get me to the next level is going to be a different thought that may still be grounded in the same certainty and trust that I told you guys about, but it's going to be a different thought. So I hold most things loosely. And because of that, there's so many thoughts that I'm always changing, right? So, you know, there are things, I, I will tell you a big one that I haven't actually told anybody and I don't even know when this is going to air, but whatever. I had this thought a couple of days ago that I would like to have a conference next year for women physicians about money. If you asked me a week ago, I would have laughed at you and said you're nuts that I would even consider that. But it's an idea that I had a couple of days ago and it's ringing louder and louder and I probably will do it. So thinking that I cannot organize a conference is a thought. Thinking that I could not write a book. I thought I was bad with writing books, right? So my life is literally about me knocking out beliefs that I've had about myself. So everything that I believe about myself today, I would say 80% of that will probably change for, for good because I'm only going to keep doing even bigger things in life. And that's just a choice that I've made. Awesome. What's the last piece of advice that you would give to somebody who's just starting out on their journey? I would say that, you know, it's easy to compare it's easy to look at others and look at what advantage that they have. I'm a firm believer that we all have advantages, and I call them, you can call them unfair advantages, 
uh, but I believe that we all have them. But it's going to be hard for you to see that advantage that you have if all you do is focus on other people's advantages only. Yes, there are times when you look at it because it's hard not to see and it may be annoying, but I want us to spend, I would say, 90% or maybe 80% of our energy looking for our own advantage and really understanding that we are more than capable and we cannot compare our own beginning to other people's end and just start like and honestly that's one of the reasons why I came on here I love by the way I love what you guys do I love this I love what you guys do encouraging sharing different stories very diverse stories of different journeys and I think that if I can go from where I was seven years ago to being here today and I know that there's going to be part of my story that you're going to listen to and you'll go but you're a physician I can trust me there are more broke physicians than not and it may be hard for most people to understand that but again if you focus only on my own advantage and not focus on your own advantage you're going to miss your journey and that would be the biggest loss of all so just start wherever you want to start from I started with a 200k property in a state that I don't live in because that's where I could start from right but just get started will you be coming in the process is probably more important than anything you're ever going to achieve and just remember that regardless of how much you owe or how much you have none of that defines you I think we all are amazing in our own way so that's that would be a last minute you know whatever that I can share Awesome. That's Dr. Latifat with a net worth of $2 million. Thanks for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to the Millionaires Unveiled podcast with Jace Mattinson. For more stories, investment opportunities, and information, check out our website, millionairesunveiled.com. See you next time when you'll hear from another everyday millionaire.